Welcome back, everyone. I'm Casey Ducker again, and this is lecture 4B, the second video for module two of the course. So continuing um, week four on program synthesis, um, last video, we talked about circuit decomposition and control flow. And today I'll introduce some of the fundamental limitations imposed by quantum physics on how we decompose our circuits and implement them. So uh, we'll review no cloning theorem and interference, um, and then we'll get into um, ancilla qubits or ancillary workspace qubits. Um, and then the second half, we'll talk about uncomputation, where we run our program backwards to clean up intermediate results. Um, and then talk about applications to compilers, where the compiler can make decisions relating to ancill and uncomputation. And then at the end, we'll talk about some interesting alternative techniques to ancill and uncomputation that are related to this. So let's get into it. Okay, so if you remember from previous lectures, the no cloning principle basically says you can't copy a qubit state to a separate independent qubit state. So take this um, state on the left here. Um, that's the normal state for qubit, and we want to make a duplicate of it um, for whatever reason. Um, so here's this, if you could clone it, this is the state you would get here. And it's this separable state of two qubits, um, which is identical to the input state. Um, but notice these square betas and square alphas, there's no linear transformation that can generate this. So we can't do this. Um, so the best we can do is use a CNOT gate to copy the binary values 0 and 1 onto a second qubit, shown in this circuit on the right. And that's where um, if this qubit's a 0, it will perform an X gate on this input qubit, making it a 1. Um, and if it's a 0, it won't do that, and so it'll stay a 0. So while this does copy the binary value, what ends up happening is they're now entangled. So you get this state where, yes, you do still have the alpha and beta coefficients for both 0 and 1 of each qubit, but now they are entangled. So qubit z if they're both 0, they're either both 0 or both 1. You can't independently measure 1 without affecting the result of the other one. So this will be important later. Um, now let's talk about interference. So here's a little demo circuit where um, basically it's making a bell pair here on, with these two gates on the left. And then this circuit on the right is all it's doing is measuring the phase of the bell pair or the sign on the one state. So it'll be zero if the sign is positive, it'll be one if the sign is negative and in between if it's a complex sign. So we'll play this video here um, of the circuit. So you add the Z gate and it turns on because Z adds a phase of minus one to the bell state. That's all nice. But once you add a C naught gate here to copy out the intermediate state. Um, so say you wanted to debug your circuit and see what this state was in the middle of your computation by copying it to this ancilla to read out later. But it messes up your result. So here, um, it's showing the same thing with um, a variable phase. So as the phase changes, the output measurement changes. But when you measure it with the C0 to extract the intermediate result, it completely ruins the algorithm and we get a 50-50 chance of measuring a one, which gives us no information, no matter what the angle is on that phase. Okay, so this showed basically why, even though the C naught, all it's doing is copying that binary state onto the ancilla if it's a one or a zero without modifying what that binary state was, um, it's actually ruining 
the effect of this algorithm that it was trying to inspect. Um, so the technical term for this is um, phase kickback. Um, but what this does is show us that if we leave intermediate states of our computation around on extra qubits, um, that will ruin the effect of the quantum computation. And this happens because um, it prevents quantum interference from occurring. So now I'll go back to um, a visualization tool for what a quantum circuit does as the gates are applied um, that was visited in one of the earlier lectures called the path sum or Feynman path integral. And it's just representing the state of the system from, le as, from left to right as time progresses as each gate is applied. So this is our circuit that we just saw. Um, and the Hadamard gate basically makes a superposition of the two qubits. And so we show that in this diagram as a splitting of two possible um, classical states. So now it's either in the zero, zero state or the one, zero state with equal amplitudes. Um, the C0 gate simply takes a binary input and converts it to another binary state. So it does nothing if the qubit's zero and it toggles that one if the qubit is one. Um, then the Z gate just adds a phase if it's a one. Um, the Hadamard gate adds a phase only in the case where it's taking a one to a, a one in superposition. And you can derive all of this from the matrix representation um, of this same circuit where the Hadamard has one negative entry in it and the Z gate has one negative entry in it. This is just a um, sparse representation of that matrix multiplication. So then the interesting part is over here at H1 where uh, interference occurs. So when these paths converge, you add the amplitudes. So on this first and last state, the amplitudes um, cancel and end up with no amplitude in that state, which means that you can never measure that state. And in other cases, the amplitudes add up and so you get a larger amplitude at that state, a higher probability of measurement. And then the C naught just computes it so that our first qubit here stores our result. And we can measure the first qubit and always get a one. So that algorithm tells us that we had a Z gate here causing a phase. So now if we add in that C naught gate, what it does is it takes this zero, zero, zero state to zero, 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 and the one, one, zero state down here to the one on one state. And then the rest of the algorithm progresses as normal where we ignore the final qubit and do the same things with the first two qubits. But what happens now is that um, interference no longer occurs because that final qubit is a one here or a zero here. So they don't interfere. Interference only occurs between identical states for, between all the qubits. And then now they don't interfere, nothing cancels out, and we end up with an equal chance of measuring any possible state, which is a useless answer for our algorithm. So it'll be important later to show that um, this is bad. And if we can somehow undo this effect by putting this extra qubit back in the zero state, no matter what, whether or not it was a zero or one, which no matter which path you took, if you can put it back to a zero without measuring it, then you can restore the interference. Um, but it turns out that if you just um, reset it to zero, um, that's the same as measuring it. And then if it's a one performing an X gate on it, so it has the same detrimental effect. Okay, so now let's get into the main part of today's lecture. So what's, what's an ancilla? So ancilla are basically um, the local intermediate states of your computation. So in like a classical program, you've got functions um, with intermediate, with variables in the middle that, for example, here calculates a hypotenuse of a triangle where you have to multiply two numbers 
store those in temporary variables and then add those temporaries before you can then take the final square root and return the result. Um, so without those intermediate results, you can't compute the output. There's no way to go directly from input to output. So someone, so these values are stored somewhere in memory. Um, classically, they're stored in the stack, on the heap, or somewhere else, and the compiler takes care of all of those details of where they're stored and deleting them afterwards. Um, this is also the case for logic circuits, where it's a bit simpler. It's just any wires that are not connected to the inputs or the outputs are intermediate wires. Um, so quantumly, we have very similar to this logic um, circuit diagram, but we are restricted that each of these gates is reversible. So all the inputs correspond to unique outputs. So we can't directly do an AND gate. So instead we um, say, if both these inputs are one, then toggle this last one. So if we always put a zero qubit on the input, we know that this it's going to be the AND of these two inputs if that was one. So that's the basic, that's a basic use of an Ancilla. And then once we have this temporary result, we can use it later for other gates. So now if C0 and C1 are one and C2 is a one here, then apply this target. Um, and that's the basics. So now we'll get into a couple of examples to show a little more about how this works. So um, this is a four controlled not gate or a generalized toffle gate. And one way to implement this out of, out of smaller gates is to pair up each of the controls into twos and say, if this control is one and that control is one, then write this temporary result. And then do it again for this control and this control and write to a different temporary result. And then once you've done that, you now have half as many controls and you pair those up and write to your target. And that works pretty well. Um, and you can extend this to um, things like adders and other things. But what if you don't have any insular? What if you don't want to use insular? Um, then you can do something like this, uh, which has many, many more gates. Um, I'm not going to get into this whole thing, but you can see this link below if you're curious. Um, so you can see that by using Ancilla, we were able to use this very simple technique. But if we don't have Ancilla, we can still do any operation we want to. Um, it just takes many more gates. And it turns out that with um, quantum computing, you can actually implement any operation you want with no Ancilla. Um, it just might take exponentially many gates in the number of qubits you have, um, depending on um, what operation it is. All right, so here's another example. Um, so this is the Kakaro adder we saw uh, last time, where, um, and this is not using Ancilla. So you can see it's performing operations in place here, and then calculating the output um, in place on the register B. So this is adding the numbers A and B, the binary numbers A and B, and then replacing B with the binary number representing the sum. So if we have Ancilla though, um, we can do this second different adder um, by Draper. And this stores intermediate results onto Ancilla here. And then it can use these intermediate results to generate more intermediate results on these later Ancilla, like this one. Um, and then collect all these results um, to then more efficiently add two numbers. So this the one on the right looks a little bit more complicated, but it's actually um, faster than the uh, Kakaro adder. Um, and you can see this because um, in the Kakaro adder, 
you have um, this like linear structure where you have this step, and another step, another step. And each of these steps, um, if you add, if you want to add two bigger numbers, then you have to add more of those steps. However, in the Draper adder, it does all these first steps in parallel um, because it can store those infinite results on Encilla. And then it has this like tree structure where it combines the results um, and into here. And then it combines those intermediate results again onto later gates and again, all the way until it gets down to the bottom of the circle. So because of this tree structure, um, you end up taking a log number of steps where log in the number of bits in the number you're adding, which is much faster than linear, where you take n steps if you have n bits in your number. So if you have a 16-bit number you want to add, this takes 16 steps, and this one takes four steps. So this gets into an interesting trade-off we have, where the more ancilla you have, the less time it takes to compute. Um, and this is actually the same trade-off we have in classical algorithms um, of space versus time complexity. Um, so, a so a common example of this is sorting algorithms, where, for example, bubble sort um, looks at one element at a time and moves it and uses no extra intermediate memory to store any intermediate results. So it's very memory efficient, but it is very slow. Versus merge sort where it takes, it has an entire large array that it uses it to store the intermediate um, subarrays that it sorts and then merges. Um, and we have this same trade-off in quantum algorithms. Um, where it becomes number of qubits or equivalently number of ancilla versus the number of gates or the number of time steps. So this is a very important trade-off because current devices and devices for a while will be limited in number of qubits, but also limited in their lifetime or coherence time, how long we can actually do a computation for before errors overrun our results. So it's very critical to look at, to balance the number of ancilla versus the amount of time. And we'll be under hard constraints when compiling for this. Okay, so now let's talk about the second half of um, today's video is uncomputation. So we use those ancilla um, and to make our circuits faster, but now we have all this junk intermediate um, data sitting around that's going to ruin quantum interference. And so we need to clean up the values in all those ancilla and put them back to zero, whether or not they were one or zero before, all without measuring them. So that's where uncomputation comes in. So with uncomputation, if you noticed, I never talked about the right half of any of the example circuits, and that's because this right half is doing on computation. So basically what on computation is, is you first, on the left, you calculate your result and you use it. So here it's calculating intermediate values on these ancilla, then it's using it. But now to, we have to undo the calculations that created the values on these ancilla. So because if C2 was one and C3 was one, then it performed an X gate here. We need to perform another X gate to undo that only if C2 is a one and C3 is a one. So you either have two Xs applied to A1 or zero Xs and either zero or two corresponds to a binary value of zero at the output if the input is a zero. And same, similar for A0. And when they're both zero at the output without measuring them, now we've restored interference on the rest of the circuit. 
Um, now this is only possible because quantum gates are reversible. So every gate has an inverse. In this case, the Toffoli gate is its own inverse. So we just have a second Toffoli gate here, but some gates we have like um, the T gate or the S gate, we have to use an inverse T gate or an inverse S gate. <clears throat> so when we do this classically, <clears throat> we have garbage collector reference counter or something that detects that you're done, with, done using some temporary value and then deletes it from memory. And what it does there is it just marks to say that that memory is not being used anymore. And maybe it overwrites it with zeros. Um, but we can't do this um, like that as simply as that in quantum computing because that's equivalent to measuring the qubit and then setting it to zero afterwards. And if we measure the qubit, then we break interference. So we have to do extra computation here to um, put it back to zero without that measurement or deletion. So in a moment, we'll talk about how a quantum comp compiler um, can manage this memory for us. Um, but first, let's revisit the examples from earlier. Um, so here, we're doing uncomputation in here, which is pretty simple. You just take the left half of the circuit minus this middle part that applies the final um, computation and just mirror all the inverse gates onto the right. And that's how uncomputation normally works. Um, in more complicated cases like this, where we don't have insula, it might get more complicated because you have gates modifying the controls here, but the controls are supposed to be, stay the same at the end of the circuit. So this gate here has to be uncomputed again here and maybe again here. And um, then this over here is probably all done computation from something that happened in the middle. And this gets into um, some nitty gritty algorithm design for specific algorithms um, where you have to integrate the uncomputation with the actual computation carefully. Um, we're not gonna get into this in this course, but it's important to know that there's other ways uncomputation can look like. Uh, and here's the addition again, um, where you can see the same mirror structure in both of these, but it's actually doing more arithmetic in this uncomputation half and uncomputing. So it's putting um, the register A back to the way it was, but leaving S um, with the sum. And then here, it's a little bit more subtle where the colored gates are all uncomputed exactly the same, but these middle gates change the value of the controls. Um, and so you have to use a bit of um, math to, to analyze what possible states these all could be in and ensure that yes, actually these and still will be restored to zero at the end. Because just by looking at this circuit, it's not obvious. Okay, so let's get into what this means for compilers and architecture. So if you have, say like an algorithm, it has functions and subroutines, um, each of which can request Ancilla um, and they can like define their computation part and how to uncompute. Or that can be automatically generated to just automatically just take your computation part and automatically give you the uncomputation part. Um, a lot of this is current research area in compilers where many programming languages just let you define a list of gates without defining what, which parts are computation, which parts are uncomputation. So unless the compiler can tell which is computation, which is uncomputation, it can't apply any of these techniques I'll talk about in a moment. But um, in general, the compiler has several considerations 
So it can prioritize um, parallelization or it can prioritize number of qubits, um, which is our space time trade-off. And then there's other considerations like communication costs where in a future lecture, when we talk about um, mapping and how qubits are actually located on devices, there's a cost to moving qubits across the device versus having set different sets of ancilla used in different parts of the algorithm. So on the right here, we've got two piece sub pieces of some algorithm. Um, they each need ancilla. If you have plenty of ancilla, you can give them all four of these groups of ancilla and let them run in parallel. If you don't have enough ancilla, then you will have you have to run them in series where this one gets to run with two groups of ancilla, then uncomputes them. And then later this one runs and uses these two on different, on the same ancilla that this one just released. And you can formalize this into a compiler pass or compiler technique where given this hierarchical program, you have multiple options. You can um, always immediately uncompute and reclaim those ancilla for somewhere else in your computation, like here. And then, so in this middle of the circuit here, you can now use these ancilla or half of these ancilla for some other part of the calculation. Or you can just hold on to those dirty ancilla that you've used until you're all the way done with your whole computation and then only on to get the end. And this takes more ancilla because other parts of your computation might need ancilla. And it turns out, um, you can read more about it in this paper, um, that there's actually a sweet spot in between these two where depending on um, how many ancilla you have and how easy communication is, um, you can sometimes uncompute, sometimes not uncompute. Um, an important note here is that um, the compiler does need to understand um, the structure of the program and which parts are computation and which parts are uncomputation so that it can apply this. And that's an important part of um, programming languages um, to be able to represent things like this. Okay, so now that we've talked about Ancilla and uncomputation, let's um, quickly discuss some interesting alternatives that can be used in some special cases. So we've talked about Ancilla as these zero qubits that we can use and then set back to zero. But we can also use qubits that we don't know their value. So we can, if we have some part of our circuit that needs Ancilla and other qubits in the algorithm are idle, we can actually steal them while they're idle, use them in, a, in this circuit, and then set them back to their old value, and then give them back to that, um, the other part of your algorithm. So when you do it this way, since you don't know what value it is, you have to perform a few extra gates to say if it's, so basically you say, do it, and then and then toggle it and then do it again if it's one and do it again if it's a zero um, to make sure that the thing you actually want to happen happens exactly one time, no matter what this value is. And this can give you a bit of overhead and gates, but this is actually much better than that zero ancilla version that I um, showed you before. Okay, so there's another alternative to ancilla here which where if you have Q trits or Q dits, which is breaking out of the binary abstraction of qubits. So instead it can actually store um, what it would have stored on the ancilla in the two state of one of the uh, input qubits. So in this circuit, um, you can see it has a similar structure to the multiple controlled knock gates we looked at before, but instead of ancilla, it's actually using one of the input controls um, as um, that intermediate result. 
So here you can, and we have to mark the controls here as one or two because now there's multiple values that could activate the controls. So here, if qubit zero is one and qubit two is one, it will add one to the value of qubit one. So if it's a zero, it becomes a one. If it's a one, it becomes a two. So only if zero, one, and two, qubit zero, one, and two are in the one state will qubit one become a two. Same for this group of qubits below. And then only if this is a two and this is a two and this is a one, will this become a two? And you have that log structure again, propagating the value to this final gate that applies to the target. Um, and this is great because you now don't have, you don't have to use any ancilla, so you're saving qubits. And you get the time and gate savings of using Ancilla in this like parallel structure here. Um, the downside is that some devices um, can't access higher states like this. Um, like, well, trapped ions can, um, depending on the type of ion. Um, superconducting qubits can, but there's higher error associated with higher states. So there's downsides. Uh, it's a trade off. Of downsides to do doing that, um, and um, providers don't support access to these higher states yet by default. And then finally, um, there's also alternatives to uncomputation. So this is called measurement-based uncomputation, where instead of reversing the computation to undo it, you actually measure the qubit you want to uncompute in a, in a certain basis um, that's orthogonal to the um, computational basis so that you can very carefully erase it in a way that only adds a um, phase to the remaining qubits that you can then fix up based on the measurement result. So um, on the left here is actually showing a Toffoli gate, but it's been optimized assuming that it gets a specific input state so that it can be run with three CNOTs instead of the normal six CNOTs for Toffoli. Because once you know one of the input states, you can cancel out some of the gates and make it um, more efficient. So now normally to uncompute this, you would mirror it and replace the inverse T gates with T gates and the T gates with inverse T gates. Um, but instead of that, you can just do this circuit on the right, um, which is simply just a Hadamard and a measurement. And if the measurement is a one, then that means there was a phase error that this measurement caused, which you can fix up with a control Z gate. And so this is really nice if measurements are easy in your architecture. Um, but current, current hardware that's available now either can't do mid-circuit measurements or the measurements are slow and error prone. So this is actually worse than just running these gates in reverse. Um, however, in error corrected architectures, measurement is easy, but T gates are hard um, as we'll talk about in a few lectures. Um, so if measurements are easy and T gates are hard, then this is a big win. You now have two easy gate or three, two and a half easy gates on average, uh, instead of a bunch of hard gates. Okay, so in summary, um, we learned about Ancilla, um, which are used to store intermediate results for computation. Um, we learned that the garbage values stored on these Ancilla can ruin quantum interference and make our algorithms not work. But we can uncompute this garbage um, to restore our interference effects. And compilers have a lot of flexibility in when and how we do this uncomputing and which ancilla we give to any, any of our subcircuits. Um, and we also still have the flexibility of which of these subcircuits we even choose when we decompose. Um, and then additionally, if our architecture supports higher level qubits or mid circuit measurement, then we can do these other more efficient methods. 
Okay, thanks for watching. Um, next week, we'll get into how to optimize some of these circuits um, by using these limitations we've learned to smartly um, cancel out gates or change gates. So see you all next time.